Hello. Does this? Oh, this works. Cool. Hello. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get started soon, so uh, please uh, keep the chatter to a minimum. Um, that was that was quick. Nice. It's a full house in here today, isn't it? I see that uh, a lot of people like art. That's a good way to start. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Show Don't Tell: The Intricacies of Metaphors in Visual media, and yes, that is a mouthful, but we're going to try to talk about it anyway. Um, today, we're just going to be going over what is a metaphor? How does that work in visual media? How does that affect the work that we do? Um, what is the thought process that goes into creating a metaphor? Um, and today, I'm joined by a lovely group of panelists that we'll discuss that with. Um, I am Ryan. I'm the art director at Playside Studios, as well as Oh, this is a mouthful as well. Game lead of uh, Age of Darkness, um, and I'll be moderating the panel today and um, trying to ask some questions. Uh, we won't be doing a lot of Q&A with the audience today, but uh, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll pass it around and then open it up to some questions. I'll uh, pass it around for you guys to introduce yourselves now. Yeah, is the microphone's on. Is yeah. it on? Oh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephanie Everett. I'm a senior 3D artist at League of Geeks. I specialize in environments and characters, um, and that's... That's me. Oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is Benjamin E. I work at Summer Fall Studios as the art director, working on Stray Gods, the role-playing musical. <laughs> um, I'm Zara. I am a concept artist and illustrator. I'm currently working on my own video game in the process of making a company. It's taking a while, but we're getting there. Um, and my day job is at another studio called Guck. And yeah, I'm excited for this talk. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Hannah. I work as a senior 3D artist at Gameloft Brisbane. Um, and I've also worked in characters and environments over my career. So. Awesome, cool. Well, I guess we'll kick it off first. Hannah, what is a visual metaphor? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> put me on the spot. Uh, yeah, it's. That's actually quite tricky, I suppose, because we're used to metaphors in a um, textual sense of, you know, this thing is that thing, is the basic idea of a, a metaphor, using one thing to represent something else. Um, I think visually it can be a lot more subtle because visuals can be interpreted in different ways and depending on the visuals that you use um, together, you can create a lot of different meanings. But I suppose it's visually trying to convey a message uh, through the choices of shapes and colours and all of the things that we have at our disposable, disposal to, um, uh, yeah, tell a story without words. Cool. I don't know. Did anyone else have Would anyone things? else like to offer a definition? No, that was sick. <laughs> <laughs> this is meant to be a discussion. We're not meant to all agree straight away. <laughs> well, maybe, uh, you know, I guess one thing when we all actually met up last week was we all had a different interpretation of what the title of this talk meant. So I think um, those interpretations, it's really interesting, right? Because you think metaphors, visual media, cool, this could be so many things. There's such a wide topic to cover. So I guess, uh, Steph, what were some of the examples you thought of when you first heard that title? Well, I actually didn't think of anything. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't actually know anything. Because like, a lot of... The past work that I've been doing um, in, with environments specifically has been generated stuff. And it's really hard to tell a story when things are generated by a computer or generated by an algorithm. And then I had to think, like, how do we tell a story when it's generated by an algorithm? Well, I have no idea. That's not my, is it my job? Like, uh, it's art direction's job. Um, but there are things you can put into, like, each asset, each prop that tells something about how does this door open? Why does it open like this? Why is this a colour like this? Why do we show things with a light here and not here? And these are all things that we inherently just don't even think about when after years of experience of other people saying, why are you doing it like this? We just absorb this knowledge and then through our observations and our interpretations of the world around us, we have channeled that knowledge into what we put into our objects on screen, whether they're automatically or generatedly placed or placed by hand. So... I don't know. I didn't actually know what metaphors in game art would mean. Yes. I just had no idea of it. Yeah. I, I really relate to um, the way you talk about like not really knowing how to do it consciously, not thinking about it, because I guess it's the same way that like a narrative writer might learn a language and learn grammar in order to tell a story, to tell metaphors. <laughs> Artists learn um, visual grammar 
Um, and sometimes you absorb it so well that in the same way that when someone speaking a different language asks you, why do you say things like that? You have to really think about like, why do we do it like that? It just seems right. I just know that that's the way we do it. Um, so yeah, sometimes it can be really hard to break down why we do what we do. Yeah, I'm like, I find myself having like random bursts of inspiration and motivation um, and that like, I end up making a decent artwork. And um, unfortunately, I can't always fluke it with like, when I revisit these good artworks that I have, um, I can't, um, I realise that the, the values or like the colours are nailed, but I can't nail it every time. And I think, um, I realise I'll be able to nail it every time I think about all the elements of art. And one of them, one of the key elements being storytelling, along with composition and values. So thinking about all the elements at once helps you create that really good, like storytelling, um, metaphorical artwork, whatever you want to call. It. Yeah, totally. They all all the elements work together. It's not just one single thing. Like I use this one color, and it means X. It it means something within the context of everything mm. else that you've done. Mm. Yeah, there's like um, talking about like a lot of like principles when it comes to like art making, visual stuff like. Relativity matters mm -hmm. quite a quite a lot, and like you could think of it as like color relativity and what this sort of means. Like when something is blue next to something that's red, they both contrast and push each other. Um, in the same way, you can use a lot of the language and design choices in like composition or anything to push one another and support in certain ways. Um, yeah, like I was just at a um, I was just at the the panel for um, storytelling without words, which was very good, um, and it was. They were talking about how, well, the, one of the things that stood out to me was just like, um, like these like decisions are based, are, are kind of informed by the things that you don't put in as well, right? Like, you know, your decisions are, are, ba are based on what you can't do. Um, and similar to the way, like I come from more of a background of like illustration, originally starting in illustration then, art director, you know? <laughs> um, but in, in illustration, it's a really big challenge because like you've, You've only got the the little, you know, um, screen. screen. <laughs> yeah, the screen that that you like that you're element from the whole story. Exactly, you got this like little canvas, and and so everything that you do kind of really matters, and everything points towards something else. And um, um, I don't know if I'm making much sense right now. You I'm kind are. of but rushing on a high. How, how are you telling the story outside that canvas? Like you're taking a frame, right? Yeah, and you're exactly. You're also trying to tell the story outside yeah. that frame. I was. This is, uh, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, but I'm kind of just like going off my fucking... Just keep going. It's, it's all great. <laughs> but, uh, it's a mind palace. It's a mind palace. Welcome to my mind palace. <laughs> uh, there is uh, some advice that I, was, I received from an artist friend of mine once where he was just like, if your composition looks really strange and like muddy and flat, either go really zoomed in or really zoomed out. And I found that really interesting. I was like, why, like, I can see why you would zoom out so you can see more things, but why would you zoom in further? And it's the idea that like, even if you're showing a piece of a thing, it'll complete itself in the in the mind of whoever's experience, right? Right. So like stuff like yeah, if you if you drew something that was a, a perfect semicircle, you can kind of visualize the rest of the circle that happens off the screen. And so just like using um, you're you're using the context of which the or you're assuming the user has as well of just being like you know what a circle looks like. If I do part of a circle, you get the rest, right? Or like. For example, I could do a full, a, a painting is a 2D, oh, I'm sorry, I'm really just going no, off. Just keep going. <laughs> a painting is like a 2D representation of all these things that you're putting together, but it, at the end of the day, it's just a representation, right? I'll take you one further. What does a circle even mean? Oh my God, the circles, it's all about the circles. Um, yeah, circles, <laughs> and it's also, I did another, oh my God, I'm, I'm continuing. <laughs> I did another talk before about like, um, way back in the 2019 talking about like, uh, it was called like big mood lighting color yeah. punk stuff and it's just like yeah you remember it yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it was about kind of like um, we can sort of assume the things that like circles are like calming rounded um, some might even say divine and how perfect they are mm. um, there's like um, assumptions to be made there as well but at the end of the day it's based on the context of the user and sometimes that can mean like for example a circle could mean divine in the way like uh, like in the old the olden days, it, it was often used like the, the light behind the Jesus halo. Yeah, the halo and kind of thing. So it was like, uh, it means divine. But 
in another context, you could say the circle represents death in the way that it's full complete, right? Mm. And so, like, there's a lot of things that you can you can do with that. And um, the circle. I was thinking circular characters are lovable creatures. Yeah, yeah. and I'm like, yeah. are they yeah. dead? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's even, it's even used in like uh, youth youthful oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. youthfulness, right? Where you've got round faces, chubby yeah. cheeks. Yeah, that's, safety, that's, a sense safety. Safety. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like to contrast that with like villainous characters, like a cute, squishy character that's actually a villain. Yeah. Well, that's well. the thing, because, um, like I say, people have all of these associations that they bring along with any sort of um, visual, like a circle, you know, sh different shapes, uh, different colours um, have a lot of different meanings, and it really is about the context of what else you're putting with it mm -hmm. as well. And sometimes, because people do have those associations that they bring along with these visuals where we assume something round and circular it's soft it's got no sharp edges it's not dangerous that's mm. one of the things we might think of when mm. the, a circular or a round or a you know chubby kind of character and you can flip that if you want to try and subvert people's expectations by going here is the thing that you thought that you know the metaphor for what you thought you were getting and we're going to make this character actually quite dangerous or yeah. you know evil in some way mm -hmm. um because you know what people are going to bring to that based on the visuals they're seeing in their own minds and yeah. yeah, that's why grandmas and children are always great, like, demonic creatures. <laughs> <in horror. laughs> well, that's why, like, when people come with, like, one expectation of, like, oh, it's a, you know, a small child character, they're going to be sweet and innocent, and I need to protect them, and then they turn out to be um, an enemy in the game or villainous or, you know... It how, how do you, it hits even harder because it's, like, completely flipping what they're expecting. Totally. How do you then communicate that transition? So if you've got visual language that then communicates that they are friendly and safe... How do you then communicate to the player that that is now something to watch out for? That's an enemy. That's dangerous. There's something called the Uncanny Valley, yeah. and like I've researched it forever, mm. and like exploring that, changing one aspect of the character, like giving it like sharp, like um, separated teeth on the mm. child. Um, I'm getting excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on the alley. But yeah, you're right. Like, you don't have to completely change the whole look of the character. Sometimes it's enough to just bring one element that you associate with, like, an evil character, like glowing red eyes, yes. or suddenly they have sharp, pointy teeth. Or they're still looking exactly as, you know, cute and angelic as ever, but suddenly they pull out a big butcher's knife. Like, mm -hmm. you just have to bring one element in, and then that can mm -hmm. really... Um, be even more disturbing because the rest of the character is still giving you the wrong signals, like mm. uh, opposite signals for what the visual should mean. Um, but now you have this one element where you're like, we are not in Kansas anymore. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting about like um, shapes and visual language um, changing over time via pop, pop culture as well. Mm. For example, I was working back in 2006 at a studio called Fuzzy Eyes in Brisbane. And um, at the time, we were designing this princess's gown, and she had this uh, triangle sort of feature at the front. It looks very elegant. And then I think the Da Vinci Code was out around that time. And in the movie, they were saying something about, like, I don't know, the womb looks like this, and it's an upside-down triangle, and it's a very feminine shape. And then afterwards, like, we could not put triangles like this on women because <laughs> it, apparently it was masculine shape. And so it was just... Complete, like we never associated a triangle like this mm -hmm. with a masculine until mm -hmm. after that movie. And then mm -hmm. it's insane, like how much our perception shifted. Mm -hmm. A masculine princess sounds awesome. I know, right? <laughs> I thought it looked really good on her. Right, yeah. <laughs> but it is very interesting the way that, like, yeah, the the cultural context of like, you know, real life is like really, again, like because we're 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 basing our like metaphors and stuff based on what our knowledge of what people think is true and so like when that yeah. shifts beneath us most of the time they're fairly stable but sometimes like in that situation was like don't use triangles anymore because people think that's evil yeah you know um and so it's yeah like small little context changes like that make it really um unpredictable and chaotic at times mm. for sure and yeah like the the i think i think it's an important thing to to mention is just like yeah like the context of things mm. shifts stuff a lot i was thinking about how um there's this little game called Dragon Age. Um, oh, I think I've heard of it. You've heard of it? Yeah, yeah it's something, something, something crazy. Uh, Dragon Age 2 in particular um, was very interesting because the, the main character, Hulk, would have these designs that appeared quite angular and sharp, which is normally reserved for, like, you know, bad people and stuff, like in Lord of the Rings and stuff. They're like, orcs, you know? Spiky. Like, spiky. But in this context, it was kind of like, 
there was a there was spikes that we used for the main character and like very like towering um, symbology and and like shapes used for like um, the essentially oppressors, right? And it was so interesting. Now this sharp thing that was supposed to be dangerous meant like renegade or the rebellion, right? And change into a good thing. And it's so easy to accidentally flip the switch on some of these like contextual cues, like yeah, like a long, sleek narrative shapes kind of thing could mean justice and order, but it could also mean oppression, right? Mm. Um, just even just like a something simple as a lighting change because it is in like a sense like that's almost the same thing but in different degrees so mm. yeah instead of being really surface level with the visual choices that you make like you know this color is good this is bad these shapes are evil these ones are good is like going a little bit deeper to what's the actual underlying meaning behind those things um like yeah like you know um tall straight shapes have strength Mm. Um, they have order, they have a certain calmness to them, but like you can use that to tell a lot of different stories. Like that could be good, that could be bad, depending on the rest of the context. Mm. Like it's about um, yeah, the underlying meaning. Like colors are a tricky one because people mm. often go, it's like uh, I'm trying to think. Like red is stop, green mm. is go, green is um, I like health and nature but like green can also be jealousy it can be sickness mm -hmm. so like um you, it's not necessarily just one thing so it's also you know what you put with it you also have red as love but then also anger mm -hmm. right? well it's red is passion i think passion. that's like the underlying meaning yeah that's, yeah that's what i was sort of trying to get at it's like going deeper into the meaning not just looking at the surface level of how that meaning can be used like Anger is passionate, love is passionate, mm. red is more of a passionate kind of colour, whereas like blue can be a very calm colour, it can be an ordered colour. And like you were saying, like with the sort of um, the vertical lines, the, the straight tower of strength, like that can be good or it can be bad the way that like you can have love or you can have anger, but they come from the same sort of root emotion. Mm, totally. I like learning these <laughs> rules and then breaking them mm, myself. Mm. Because, like, I feel like if we don't think critically about the design we're making, we end up defaulting to stereotypes and just very, like, regurgitate something that's already been made. I find that extremely important. Learning the rules, yes. knowing the rules, practising the rules, and then, you to know... To break how... it so that people understand what you're doing Yeah, there. Yeah, so you can't break the rules without understanding them first. Absolutely. Which is really Because, like... If I, I guarantee you, if I went on, like, Art Station and searched up sci-fi character... There'll be like a girl with like the little fringe cut. It's like purple hair. Mm. Like that'll be the default character that I find. But like if you ask yourself questions like, why is this person have like purple hair? They're angsty. Why is this person angsty? Because like they're in a sci fi world. Why is being <laughs> angsty got to do with a sci fi world? Because it's dystopian. Mm. And like, why is the sci fi world dystopian? I've never seen like a sci fi world that's like green and like warm colors. It's all blue, dark. Mm -hmm. There's a pink neon light somewhere. <laughs> no one's like explored. I feel like there's a lot of potential to explore mm. things. I know people say everything's already been made, but like, well, I think every story has been told. I mean, if you go back far enough, um, we have like, you know, the, the Greek myths and tragedies and plays. Those stories have already, already always been told, I think we should probably not be afraid of retelling stories because it is like the retelling of these kind of stories and bring it into a new context for a new time and a new audience. Um, but we do have like the same basic stories that we tell over and over again. Like there's the idea of the narrative archetype characters where you have the hero character, like the hero's journey and all that sort of thing. You have the, the wise mentor, you have um, the, the sidekick who is there for moral support. You have the, the evil villain, we see the same characters over and over again because we are telling the same kind of stories. It's not a bad thing, I think. It's mm -hmm. um, as long it's as you add like your own twist to it. Exactly. It's like when it starts to get a little bit too insular, and I think that video games um, has the possibility of becoming insular because people who only ever, like you're saying, look at other video game art for their inspiration to make their own video game art. Yeah. I think it can get like very shallow and surface level um, without a deeper understanding of artistic concepts. I think it's a really important thing as artists to study the really core basic um, art concepts because that gives you a lot more depth to draw from than yeah the, the sort of I think shallow studying surface reality, level. <laughs> yeah, studying like yeah. real people will mm. do so much more than studying other video games. 
Um, yeah, and studying uh, other visual media outside of video games. Like, there's a yeah. lot of really cool stuff to learn from film because, in a lot of ways, um, we're doing the same sort of thing. We're seeing uh, images yeah, through screens. Scenes, yeah, yeah, like how to compose an image is something that you can learn from painting, you can learn from um, film cinematography, and then mm. you can bring all those concepts into your framing of a shot um, for a video game and tell a lot of stories. I think one of the things I remember thinking of when we were brainstorming for this, was um, changing the way you perceive a character based on their size in the frame. And I've seen some games that use this really well where they'll have a very small character right at the bottom of the screen with a very large and intimidating background. And I think as a player, I immediately get a sense that my character is small against a large and intimidating world. They are potentially vulnerable. Um, they're not a strong character. And so you can tell a lot of... Um, a lot of stuff just by the size of your character on screen, like very simple sort of things, but that's kind of also a, um, like a film sort of trick to you know, uh, give you information without telling you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the things that you were saying is um, kind of part of, like my, kind of my ethos with being an artist and going on this artistic journey, because we never stop being an artist until we're... Till we die, we are just going to look at this and be like, "That's wrong." <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, so, but one of the things you have to remember is, as an artist, we're going to take what we see and we are going to interpret it in our brain. We're going to modulate it and demodulate it, remodulate it into whatever we um, say. So, even if we are telling the same stories, we are seeing that story, we are processing it, and we are regurgitating it out. And someone is going to like that story. It's okay. <laughs> but it, that's you as an artist is telling telling other people who can't see the world how you see it and going, look how beautiful and amazing this world is. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. I will show you what it is. And that's something we shouldn't forget. That's awesome. I think uh, one thing I, I would, be, would, would be great to discuss as well is some of the examples of the metaphors that you've all used in the games and projects that you've worked on. Don't look at me. I barely know what a metaphor is. I'm looking at Ben, the art director of the table. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Is that me? Um, good. Question. Good question. There's a there's a little game I'm working on, Stray Gods, the role playing musical. It's um, it's about you know um, someone who encounters um, a whole new world of like. Turns out you know these ancient gods from Greek mythology exist, and they're just chilling in the real world, just like hey, what's poppin'? I'm here. My name is Apollo. I'm the god of the sun. You know, and it was very interesting because it is two opposite extremes of ancient and modern, and like interpreting them together. And I think. One of the, you know, like, metaphors, you know, just metaphors, just thinking about metaphors. What are the, what are the metaphors? You know, like, um, I think a lot of like, uh, metaphor that I would use would be like, for example, um, neon light or just night light that doesn't seem. Uh, I think that's what's why it's often used in like cyberpunk sort of stuff because like, pink lights and blue lights are so like unnatural feeling, and, and so. Um, it is very starkly set into like a modern sort of context, and so we use that a lot in in um, Stray Gods of just using like these like very powerful, intense colors that don't happen naturally, and yeah. kind of using them as a means to like to show this contrast of an ancient being who is now illuminated by something that wouldn't have existed all those years ago, kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so using yeah that that sort of context um, of the real world of just being like this colored wouldn't have existed kind of thing and just using that as a, as a means to push how alien and strange this experience is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think the Stray Gods has a lot of like vivid colors as a, as a, as a rule that we use um, to push that, to push that for sure, um, amongst many other metaphors. Yeah. I'm a metaphor kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, the metaphors I'm using is less profound than that. <laughs> I'm using flower language um, across the whole like game. So like flowers in the background will suggest what might happen next. Um, I know this is like like used to death, but like forget me nots is like yeah, um, not um, separating from like friendships or forgetting your loved ones sort of thing. Um, mm. Yeah, I think black dahlias um, represent, like, danger and death. Uh, orange flowers represent, like, um, friendships. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just scatter them in the background and see who notices. Yeah, I think it's... Oh, a... it's already... I already spoiled it, so... You know, <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that. We can cut that out, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, no, I think it's, it's really, I think the power of metaphors um, and like symbolism is most profound when it's something that you don't really notice. It kind of happens in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, yeah, um, just something that's like starkly always, it's just, just always there in the background. You don't really notice a change, but like anything that happens to that sort of symbol kind of represents how you feel towards it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I don't really want to get into spoilers, but there is like the, the, the Erd tree in, um, in Elden Ring is, is this like thing that's always in your vision when you're out in the world. And I think it's really fun the way that so they sort of use that as a means to tell the progression of the story and, and how the world is evolving um, through your actions and stuff. It's like this thing that has been ever present is now shifting and that is a representation of your actions and your... I love that. I love yeah. that there's like an element you're always seeing and you're dreading it like yeah. something mm. powerful. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah, that the, the omnipresence from... of, of that can oh. be like a powerful sort of image to have. Yeah. Yeah. But it also looks so beautiful and you're like, I want to go there. It's so pretty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. I thought Elden Ring was very interesting in the way that they had um, this classically safe um, colour of like gold mm. be used as a means to feel restricting almost and like yeah there's a, there's a lot of like enemies and stuff who are like I'm a golden god I shall use the gold to smite you <laughs> kind of thing and so this thing that was supposed to be like our sh you know safety and shelter and homeliness is now being used as a means to as like avoid it right overpower you essentially with the, yeah, with the gold it's, yeah, exactly, it's, it's, exactly. it's this mighty force that's overpowering you at all times exactly there exactly. was another really good game um any Final Fantasy fourteen people? Oh, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So Shadowbringers was an amazing expansion uh, for Final Fantasy fourteen, and the main enemy was these white beings of light that came in and, like, purged people and ate them and then consumed them and spat out more of these white angel creatures. And the fact that I was fighting white angel creatures because they were the enemy and they were killing the entire planet because there was no shadow left and anyone... They just wanted darkness... Because it was light all the time. Just that sort of juxtaposition mm. from, like, always fighting the darkness. It's like, mm. now I'm just fighting the light because balance is the key, not one or the other. Yeah, Bayonetta has some really good... Mm. Have you yeah. played? Yes. Yeah, oh, amazing my God, I love that game. <laughs> Say that on the panel of the guy who art directed a game that's all about you being the light against the dark. That's yes. right. <laughs> yeah. How do you look like you had something to say before as well? Oh, I was trying to think because... Um, uh, as a 3D artist, I don't often get the opportunity to uh, art direct, but I do remember I was um, uh, doing the well, art direction, being very instrumental in the art direction of a uh, small indie game that I was working on. And I was thinking about um, the way that we chose the colour palette for the characters, because I was designing a whole range of characters that you could choose from as your characters that you played. But I recall that um, we had all of the enemies had a green and red theme palette to them, which I was thinking is like a very subtle way of like, because a lot of the times visuals do push um, the gameplay and like how you're supposed to feel about the characters, which is like your characters that you could choose from, the player characters, had a very vibrant rainbow of colours. They all had their own individual colour palette that was uh, unique to them, all the enemies despite the fact that they were different and they looked quite different, had the same colour palette, which kind of othered them in the sense of, like, they were all one uniform force that you are fighting versus your characters that are, you know, uh, much more individual as you are as the player, sort of getting inside the mind of the player. It's a very simple thing. I lo think a lot of games use that, but it's something that probably isn't, like, immediately obvious when you're looking at it, but it just subtly reinforces that idea of, like, the enemy characters versus you, the player. Yeah, and just, that's such a great point. That actually brings me to um, another thing I wanted to discuss with everyone was how do you, as artists, use these metaphors to reinforce game design on the projects that you work on? Mm. Which you kind of just answered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I usually talk to design about this sort of stuff yeah. um, because they have a really good mind on the philosophy behind a lot yeah. of the decisions and um, things that we can work on together because they're always so excited to get yeah. art incorporated into design elements and design elements incorporated into art and that is the funnest part about game game development like yeah. oh my god i love doing that in art so um yeah working with designers um very very key are there, are there things that you do to help uh bring the art element to the discussion and reinforce the ideas that they're sharing 
Not that I can think of, but there is many, yes. but I just can't think of them right now. <laughs> Wait, uh, I just scroll through Pinterest forever until I find a vibe that I like, <laughs> and I just draw it. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Um, so Stray Gods... Um, Let's talk about Stray Gods again. But, um, Stray Gods is a, is a sort of like a narrative game where you like choose the dialogues and then role play as Grace as she pushes forward through the story. Um, and there are like multiple traits that you can choose, kick-ass, charming, and clever. Um, and there were lots of discussions that we had looking at Sasha Much, our storyboard artist, um, <laughs> who, like, she had a really brilliant idea of just being like, whenever you choose Kick-Ass, the character will always end up on the left side of the, of the, of the screen or something. Like, these small mm. sort of decisions enforce the idea of the game honouring your decision and respecting and, and sort of, like, being informed by you in that way. And it's, I think it's a, it's a really important thing to think about. It's just, like, the rewarding feeling of just... Um, we'll have these like visual rules that we stick to every time you make these decisions as a means that you'll get really familiar with um, as a means to like one reward you and also to kind of enforce the feeling that you're getting from this which I think is a really I think that's where like you know uses of um, symbolism and metaphors really pushes the best is when it in when it's about informing feelings right and at Summerfall, we love the feelings, you know? <laughs> and I think, yeah, st stuff like that, or just like um, being, like, having certain colors mean um, that, you know, this trait means this kind of thing, and just mm -hmm. guiding guiding through that. There isn't a whole lot of other other stuff that we do with um, Stray Gods mechanically, so it's ha a bit harder to, to answer your question, but I think that's that's one of the things that, like, stood out as a, as a means of how we would, like, honor that by having something visual consistently happen, you know? and make you feel. Yeah, I was thinking about that while you were saying that like, um, it's important to have consistency in the visuals. Like, If you've chosen a particular colour for one of your characters or for a, um, a story element, is keeping that mm. constantly consistent. Whenever it pops up, it needs to be in reference to that thing, that character, so that you don't confuse the player by giving them mixed messages. Because like, one colour doesn't mean one thing, like we were discussing, but if you've associated um, like purple with this particular evil character, then whenever you want to evoke the feeling of that character, maybe they've been in this place or a person that you're talking to is actually one of their minions, but it hasn't been explicitly said in the text, if you have that colour around, you can plant the seed in the player's mind of association, basically. So within your own game, you can just create associations and create meanings for shapes, meaning for, for colors. And if you use them consistently within your game, it doesn't have to be a global meaning necessarily, but it can be something that the player will um, always associate with that particular narrative part of your game or that uh, character. Mm -hmm. Having more like consistency with like the design, <laughs> I noticed that I pay more attention to cut scenes when there's black bars that come on, like, zoom in. Because, <laughs> like, it's extracted from film. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm paying attention now. Yeah, it's Sometimes like, we, we are know. now about to, like, deliver some sort of, you know, cinematic story device. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> I never skip the cut scenes. People who skip them, like... <laughs> so I don't know how much I have to do. So. Yeah. this panel getting judged. <laughs> One of the funny things I did, because I used to work on Dota 2 workshop items, and so I love the game, and I play this, this hero who's this complete support. Plays support everywhere. No, no one ever buys core items because that's forbidden kind of thing. He's a support, you heal, you save, that's it. So I built this set where he he's wielding a staff that's got a carry item on the end of it. And it was a desolator, and it's basically like cuts people down. And so I submitted that to the workshop, and it sold. And then the rate for him being picked as his core in the, in the game went up. So I changed the minds of. I yeah, tanked a lot of pubs. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my fault. But yeah, things you can do to change the minds of people just by adding something completely different that they wouldn't think of. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And one thing we've talked about a lot as well is. Um, how these metaphors and how these decisions influence the art style choices and the art direction of the games that we work on. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice, I guess, do you guys have for the audience when they're coming up with an art style or an art direction? What kind of decision-making process would you say they should go through to land on those metaphors that we've talked about today? Please always ask why when you're designing something, because your brain comfortably like goes to something that's like already explored a lot. And when you ask yourself why, you'll kind of force yourself to like make decisions that make sense. 
Mm. Um, that worked for me, so... Yeah. There is a difference between too. understanding and knowing, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. I know why this is, but it's like, do you understand why this is? And it's only when you ask yourself why, it's when yeah. you start to understand all of these other reasons that come before it as to why this finished product is like it is. Mm. Yeah, it's like, make sure you're um, making a conscious decision. Like, when you make a choice about how a character should look or how an environment is going to be presented, make sure you know why you're making that uh, artistic choice, not just because it looks cool. Mm. Why does it look cool? What is the actual story that you're mm. trying to tell with those visuals? Like, um, yeah, drill down deeper and, and ask mm. yourself those questions of like, why am I choosing this colour? Why am I choosing this shape? Why am I choosing an environment that is empty versus full? What is this going to convey to the viewer? And mm. is that what I want it to convey? Mm. <laughs> and document it, basically. Because you might forget it later. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I love art style guides. I'm a big fan. And uh, I think especially when you've got like a slightly larger team, it can keep everyone focused on creating those consistent visuals where you're using the same visual language within your game rather than people kind of getting their own ideas and be like, I'm going to add this in because this means this to me, but it's not consistent with the rest of the game necessarily and the visual language that you're creating within the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always document your stuff. Like, especially in the initial part of, um, like, finding your art style and, and working on a new art style. Like, let's say you join a new company and it's an art style you're not quite familiar with, like, you're okay with it. For the first three pieces of work that you'll make, it's going to be crap. I don't care. Like, <laughs> it's just going to be garbage because you're learning. Again, even you'll have thousands of years of experience. I don't care. You'll still stumble because you're learning something different. You're, you're having to think more. And because you're thinking more, you're spotting things more. And when you're doing that, what you should be doing is documenting each of the failures that you're making. So that, because you'll forget. And I forget all the time. I'll, I forgot everything like, <laughs> that I did this morning. So documenting taught me a lot. Um, League of Geeks was really good at like, letting me have the time to like, schedule in documentation for each of my tasks. So when I was able to do that, I was like, oh my god, like, this makes so much sense. Like, mm. oh, this thing that I did before, I was doing it again. Why am I doing it again if I already made the mistake here? Like, <laughs> yeah, documentation will teach you a lot about just understanding what you know. Um, and it will improve you as an artist and a developer so mm -hmm. much more. Yeah, and like remembering that you are an artist, if you're an artist, that uh, it's not just a matter of being a games artist. Like you can draw from every other artistic discipline for your ideas, for your inspirations, and bringing those into your games is going to keep it a lot more fresh and it's going to give it a lot more depth because you have thousands of years of art history to draw from. So we shouldn't ignore that because video games is such a modern art form. Like, mm -hmm. We can make it a lot deeper than it sometimes is. A lot of games approach these things at a very shallow level. And it doesn't even need to be. The things we've discussed today, while it is about art, it all applies to uh, everything. Music, game design, uh, maybe not programming, but game, <laughs> game design. Uh, you know, all the decisions we make, there's a why to it, right? Um, and that's, that's one of the key takeaways we want for you all today. Yeah, I think... I'm a bit of a weirdo gremlin <laughs> when it comes to art direction. I, I, I think for me, it, it focuses, because like, like, like we talked about today, is like, you know, different symbolism and metaphors can mean different things depending on the context. And so I don't think, like it's, it's working in isolation and just being like, well, the circles mean this, I'm gonna show, throw that in there. Um, doesn't super work for me, another, but, but what does is really paying attention to a feeling that you want. Like, you know, um, like listening to a song, being like, there's a specific feeling here. And then like having, like going through those Pinterest boards and we're like, what matches that feeling, right? And once you like collect all these things together, then you can sort of identify the patterns of like, what are these all things, what, what are they like, what are the patterns and, and um, similarities that they're sharing? And then through that, you'll, you'll piece together all the pieces that are working together to evoke that same feeling. Because I think that's the, that's the key takeaway. It's kind of like working on an equation with the answer first and then going back to find the, you know, the, the algorithm later. Uh, but just being like, if they all share this same feeling, what, what gets there? You yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and as, as humans, right, like mm. feeling is just something we naturally understand. So most of the time it isn't something you need to kind of second guess yourself on. You'll, you'll just naturally understand it. Most of the time when I'm giving feedback to any of the artists at our studio, I don't even just go give feedback. I go, why did you do this or why did you make that decision? And 80% of the time, they'll then self-assess and go, hang on, that doesn't make sense. I didn't mm. ask myself why, and they'll go back and, and fix it. It's a human nature to be able to self-assess and understand the feeling of what we're, what we're looking at or hearing or 
smelling, whatever it might be. Mm. Smelling is a big one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, is it? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> As an artist, we're very visual, right? So we just be like, oh, yeah, we'll just take a picture of the thing and... Have you ever been like to the park or something and it's a really nice day and you can smell the spring flowers? It's like, wow, I'm going to take a picture of this and capture this moment. And you look at the picture like a few weeks later and you're like, this doesn't feel like what I remembered it. Because you're not capturing like the wind on your face, the smell of the flowers, the way the, the earth felt under your feet. How do we capture that in a 2D or 3D image? And in a, it's a little bit easy with interactive medium, but... Like, that is, like, the goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> How do we use metaphors? Yeah, the little, little gold flicks on the grass yeah, to yeah, the symbolise the, the wind. the comes through yeah. the trees. I, I take billions of those photos. Yeah. And never can get it right. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just about how do we use metaphors to tell the things that we can't show, um, the, the smells that we can't smell, the, the, hear, the, the sounds we, get, we can't hear in an image. Um, mm. Those are the things I really love chasing and... It's exciting to be able to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Exactly, yeah. Well, we actually are we're pretty close to the end. Um, we've got a bit of time left, so if we'd like to do some questions, we can. Or, alternatively, and this is what I'd like to do, is we wrap it up early, and then you can all come and ask us questions uh, individually. Um, we'll, we'll be hanging around. I mean, are we hanging around? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. We're all hanging around, um, which is also you know, just, just as good. Um, but the main thing for everyone today is I want you all to challenge yourselves and stop whatever work you're doing at the moment, um, whether it is a project at work or a personal piece you've got going on, and just think about why. Why have you made the decisions you've made and how can you also increase the depth of what you're doing and increase the symbolism of what that experience is that you're trying to create? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, as well, for coming on board. Um, Big thanks to our panelists, for sure.